This is God. That's quite loud. OK. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, you get the medal for showing up for the 8 a.m. session. Um, I'm not sure if we have enough seats. So for those of you in the back, you know, fill in. Um, no, good morning and welcome. Uh, and thank you for getting up early this morning to make this session. Uh, we're going to make this interactive and fun. Uh, so uh, there are points for participation. Uh, um, so you will be called upon. Uh, so be ready. Um, I'm going to start off the session actually with just a quick poll um, and asking where people are on their microsegmentation journey. Uh, so a brief show of hands. Um, how many of you have actually started an implementation around microsegmentation? So we've got a one, two, three, four. Wow. Okay. So one, two, three, four, ten or so. Awesome. Uh, how many of you are interested in implementing microsegmentation, but you're really kind of just figuring it out, not really sure how to get started, want to learn more. Okay, so the majority of you. How many of you um, keep hearing about it, so you're here to learn more? Okay, a few more hands. How many of you just like were wandering by and said, I need a place to crash? And uh, Okay, no one? All right. Um, so here's what we're going to cover in the sec uh, the um, presentation today. Well, we're going to start off with a quick introduction on why microsegmentation. This is probably a, a refresher for some of you. Uh, maybe you'll learn a couple of things here uh, as well. And then we're going to jump into approaches to microsegmentation. Jamin's going to cover that, uh, as well as some best practices. We've got a couple of video demonstrations for you as well. Um, and then a little bit of a fun uh, analogy uh, that Jamin's put together. How many have seen this kind of slide or attack before? Anyone that was in the plenary session yesterday, um, uh, was it yesterday, the red and the, red and the blue team? Um, this is exactly uh, what happens, right? Somehow, some way, an attacker finds their way in. Uh, if you remember yesterday, the red team uh, was able to get in uh, through a phishing email. Um, here, it's a vendor portal. Uh, once the attacker has found a way inside of the environment, they're then able to move uh, and spread laterally inside of the environment. Uh, so they can move from the vendor portal into maybe the servers, uh, where they then find a juicy target, in this case, a point of sale system. In the um, uh, demonstration yesterday, uh, it was the code server. Uh, and then finally, they exfiltrate uh, the data. Uh, so this is a very common uh, attack pattern um, that, uh, that attackers like to use. Uh, and it depends on the lateral spread uh, inside of the data center. So networks are really good at doing what? I told you there was going to be participation. What are networks really good at doing? Sorry, it's hard to hear. What? I, they're really good at connecting things. They're really good at letting things talk to one another, right? Um, so most data center networks are, from a security perspective, relatively flat. So machine A can talk to machine B, um, even if machine A has no need to talk to machine B, right? They're on the same subnet. Uh, they're able to ping each other, uh, but they can be part of two completely separate and different applications. But because they're connected to the same network, they're allowed to communicate. Uh, and this is exactly what hackers leverage, is that ability to move laterally inside um, of the environment. So how does microsegmentation help? Um, so the goal of microsegmentation is to both identify and prevent the spread of uh, unknown threats uh, inside of the data center. Um, so it's about reasserting control over your environment. It's about taking those networks that are really good at connecting everything together and letting you decide and have visibility and control over what is allowed to talk to what. There's three goals for microsegmentation. The first one is around uh, reducing the attack surface. Um, some of you might also hear it called the protect surface. Uh, there's kind of different terms that are being thrown around out there uh, in the industry. Um, but it's really about creating these um, uh, smaller and smaller segments within the network so that if any one of them ends up getting compromised, uh, the attacker's not able to move laterally or it's very difficult for them to move laterally inside of the data center. Second thing is being able to contain it, right? So once, if they're able to get in, and they will find a way in, uh, how do you then prevent them from uh, moving 
uh, to other parts of the data center. So how do you contain that compromise and limit that lateral movement? And then the last part is around restricting uh, that outbound connection and providing visibility into that outbound connection uh, to prevent the exfiltration uh, of that sensitive data. All right, so microsegmentation prevents the lateral spread of threats. Um, if there's one thing you take away from the session, <laughs> if you didn't know what microsegmentation was before, uh, hopefully you do now. All right. Um, so this sounds pretty basic, um, you know, all right, it makes sense. Uh, this is something that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But when you start looking at these environments that we're all trying to secure, it's actually very difficult to do um, in, in practice. Um, so you've got your traditional data centers, uh, you've got a migration into software-defined data centers, uh, you've got this migration into uh, the cloud. Uh, so you've got all of these different computing environments your applications are spread across these different environments. Your data is spread across these uh, different environments. Uh, you've got a high uh, volume of east-west traffic flows, uh, estimated anywhere between 75 and 80% of your traffic ends up being internal uh, and within the data center. So it becomes very challenging to secure these environments um, because of the hybrid nature, because of the fact that they're uh, constantly changing through automation and orchestration. Uh, nothing is static, right? If you remember back, well, I'm older, some of you guys are about my age. Uh, if you remember back 20 years, right, it was four walls and a data center and you had a rack and you knew exactly where everything was and if someone said, oh, well, where's the ERP application hosted? You could walk them over and show them the exact server where it was. Um, all that has changed, right? It thing, you get this virtual world, uh, the VMs are moving all over the place, you've got cloud, you've got containers. Um, it becomes much more challenging to create security policy that works across all of these different environments. And that's one of the things that here at Palo Alto Networks we're very committed to is figuring out how to have consistent security policy that works across all of these different environments. So the key here is that security has to be extended wherever your apps are and enable that security to work wherever those apps um, and workloads uh, move to. So 75% of that traffic flows east-west on flat networks. Hackers know and they exploit this, right? They take advantage of this fact. You, you saw yesterday the red attacker like gleefully, like, all right, I'm in. Uh, I'm just gonna be able to move laterally within the network. Um, so being able to prevent that spread uh, is absolutely essential. Uh, in addition to some of the trends I've already mentioned, um, you've also got um, other things that are happening, right? So you've, I've talked about the data center, public cloud, uh, internet, SaaS apps, um, but you've got all of these different locations. You've got mobile users. They're working from a variety of different locations, whether it's the home or on the road, from the local coffee shop. Um, you've got managed workloads. You've got unmanaged workloads. You've got this new thing. Well, not new. It's been around forever, but IoT, right? Um, so you've got all of these different embedded devices, whether they're um, IP phones or thermostats or controls or badge reader systems. Um, these are all um, part of the network and they're all um, points of entry for a potential hacker to get into the environment. So you gotta take into consideration all of these things and make sure that um, your security is able to work even though your, um, uh, your business isn't neatly contained inside those four walls of a data center somewhere, right? It's a highly heterogeneous, um, highly distributed uh, environment. So again, hackers know and exploit this. These are complicated environments and they're very difficult and very challenging to secure. So how do you figure out uh, where the attacker is going to come in and how do you prevent them, if they are able to get in, from moving inside of the environment? How do you prevent that lateral spread? So this is not lost, right, on the compliance bodies that are out there. Um, so the EU, um, uh, the NIS directive, uh, to be able to isolate systems. Many of you may be familiar with this, particularly, particularly those of you that are involved in securing critical infrastructure. Uh, each of the different member states of the EU have implemented this in their own um, laws. So ANSI within France, or the National Cybersecurity Center within uh, the UK, or the Ministry of Information in uh, Germany. Um, so each country has taken that EU directive and translated that into their local uh, laws. Um, they all require some form of system isolation. Uh, that's part of the requirement uh, for being able to secure that critical infrastructure. Within specific um, uh, industries, 
Uh, there are other compliance uh, schemes, so SWIFT, if any of you are in the banking industry, um, uh, then you've got SWIFT infrastructure that needs to be secured. Uh, the SWIFT CSP program mandates and requires the SWIFT system be separated from, isolated from, segmented from um, the rest of the infrastructure. And the reason for that is if an attacker is able to get in and attack some piece of the network or some piece of the infrastructure, they don't want the attacker to be able to spread and move inside of the SWIFT network, okay? PCI DCSS, uh, so if you're involved in processing credit card transactions, uh, same thing. Uh, and then finally, Gartner. So Gartner in 2018, uh, I believe it was number five on their list of projects to consider for enhancing your security, micro-segmentation. Okay, so you're seeing this from uh, legislative bodies, you're seeing this from uh, industry uh, organizations, and you're seeing this from the analysts. Everyone's saying that micro-segmentation is a good idea, okay? Again, great in concept, difficult to implement in practice. And Jamin's gonna walk us through some of the practical approaches that we can use uh, to be able to um, uh, implement micro-segmentation. So with that, I'm gonna shift gears and invite Jamin up to the stage and have him um, talk through some of the approaches to micro-segmentation. Right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian, for wonderfully explaining why micro-segmentation is more important than ever before. But I would like to shift gears a bit and let me have some fun. How many of you have watched Game of Thrones? Like, okay, come on, guys. 40% of the room, that's it? All right. Uh, if you look at Game of Thrones, right, it's micro-segmentation in action. And by end of this session, I will prove you that it is, it is the same. My goal is to help you here to understand uh, the deep micro-segmentation strategy when you are in front of your CISO, you should be in a position to, to convince him that the best way to micro-segmentation, to implement the micro-segmentation is this way. You may or may not implement all the pieces of it, but whatever bits and pieces you implement, you'll be able to understand that this is just a partial implementation and where the gaps are, right? So that is my goal. But before we go into Game of Thrones things, uh, because it's a technical breakout session and you guys have paid quite a bit of money to, to come here. So let's talk a little bit more technical here. Cybersecurity industry and networking industry together have formed four approaches of doing micro-segmentation. These are also called enforcement points. The first one is network fabric. If you are implementing micro-segmentation through network fabric, you may think about this as Cisco ACI, for instance, or um, Arista's Cloud Vision micro segmentation. So, those are the prime examples of network fabric based micro segmentation. So, here you are implementing micro segmentation inside the network fabric itself. The second one is the hypervisor VMware NSX, uh, part of software defined networking technology, Nutanix Flow are some of the examples of hypervisor-based micro-segmentation uh, implementation. Third one is endpoint agent. Uh, here, the, there is no, you are not doing enforcement in the network or in the firewall. These are endpoint agents that go into your workload VMs, which is completely agnostic of how you have designed the network. The fourth one is next-gen firewall. Obviously, this is what we'll talk about um, in the session. But I would like you to understand some pros and cons of uh, each of those four approaches. If you look at network fabric-based micro-segmentation, in this scenario, the networking and security is very much coupled together. You are using the same network fabric to do the security aspect as well, right? So you are enforcing security via the network. So networking and security is tightly coupled. The exact same thing when you are going with the hypervisor-based micro-segmentation implementation. Here, again, if you are enforcing micro-segmentation inside using VMware NSX, the networking is also provided by NSX. Security is also provided by NSX. So here, again, network and security is coupled. If you look at endpoint agent-based approach, security and networking is completely decoupled. 
because these agents are completely agnostic of the network. They do not care how you have designed the network because they are enforcing the security policies right inside the VMs or the workloads. Next gen firewall on the other end, depending on how you are implementing and how much network functions you want the firewall to perform, networking and security could be coupled or it could be completely decoupled. If you are, for instance, if you are putting our firewall in a vWire mode and not doing any routing, in that case, firewall is just doing a pure security function. It is not participating in anything in the network. Right. So these are the four approaches. Every single vendor out there, they have different definitions of micro-segmentation. If you talk to VMware, if you talk to Cisco, if you talk to us, all the vendors out there, they have different definitions. But the goal is to identify and prevent the lateral movement of the threats. That is the goal that nobody in the industry is disputing. So let's keep that goal as the Uber goal here, and let's evaluate these four approaches across two dimensions. The first one is the environment, and the second one is the security value. So if you are talking about the environment where your applications are deployed, if you look at network in particular, let's say you are using Cisco ACI or Aristas Cloud Vision or any other third party um, switches. If you're doing enforcement via network fabric, you can definitely do, uh, uh, do that implementation in traditional data center as well as in software-defined data center. But your Cisco and Arista switches are not necessarily coming with you in public cloud because there is no space for it. <laughs> so you cannot do the consistent micro-segmentation in public cloud. If you are doing hypervisor-based micro-segmentation, because this hypervisor-based micro-segmentation is applicable only for software-defined data centers, only for virtualized workloads, and if you have bare metal workloads in your traditional data center, obviously the micro-segmentation cannot be performed. Again, hypervisor, for instance, if you are running VMware hypervisor, ESXi, or KVM, or et cetera, in public cloud, when your applications move, those hypervisors are not accessible. So hypervisor-based micro-segmentation essentially fails there. The last two, agent-based and next-gen firewall-based micro-segmentation are universally extensible across all these three environments, right? be it traditional data center, software-defined, or public cloud. Let's evaluate these four approaches again on a different dimension. The value of the security that you can extract from each of them. So network fabric-based, approach will definitely give you layer two to four visibility and enforcement. But neither of network fabric, hypervisor, or agent-based approach will give you the layer seven-based visibility and enforcement. And definitely, if you look at the goal, which is to identify and prevent the lateral spread of the threat, that goal cannot be achieved by, by those three approaches. Only next-gen firewall is in a position to give you the best security value from micro-segmentation perspective. It's primarily because the goal is to identify and prevent the lateral threat. You are not doing micro-segmentation for fun, right? You have a goal, which is to, to prevent the lateral spread of the threat. And how can you do that? That's what I'm saying. I'm also not saying that you do everything inside the next-gen firewall, be it hardware or virtual firewall. That's not the goal. That's not what I'm saying. There is a value add in you enforcing some pieces of micro-segmentation inside a network, be it in the hypervisor or even in, through the agents. For instance, if there are backup traffic, why do you want to waste firewalls bandwidth in doing micro-segmentation for non-critical workloads or non-critical flows? You can definitely leverage network or hypervisor or the agent to just to simply deny the traffic before even it hits the firewall. So sometimes you not only have to do micro-segmentation just through the firewall, but sometimes you have to leverage a combination of these four. So, but if you are leveraging multiple combination of these approaches, don't worry that you will not be, don't worry at all that you will not be able to extract the maximum security value out of this. It is because Palo Alto Networks has partnered with each of these vendors, with VMware, Cisco ACI, Arista Cloud Vision, to give you the best security value that you can get from the micro-segmentation perspective. 
So you can leverage the Cisco ACI fabric, Arista Cloud Vision fabric to do layer two to four visibility and enforcement. But because of our integration, you'll be able to get layer seven visibility and enforcement in a very seamless manner. It's quite frictionless. There is ACI session at about 11.30. If you are interested uh, in it, uh, do participate so that you can understand how we can do micro segmentation with ACI and Palo Alto networks together. Hypervisor based, we have six years old integration with VMware NSX. Uh, so you can do layer two to four enforcement uh, using VMware NSX's distributed firewall and you can leverage layer seven firewall from us. You can also leverage Palo Alto Network's Prisma Cloud Twist Clock agents to do agent-based enforcement if you are interested in. Right. So let's shift gear a little bit here and talk about the five pillars of a best micro-segmentation strategy. And these are five. It's complete visibility, zero trust architecture, workload tagging, automated security actions with adaptive security, and comprehensive policy. Right. Again, let's keep the goal in mind. You will realize when I walk you through each of these five steps, you will realize that it is not just about technology, but it is as much about the process as it is about technology. The process that you implement in your organization is equally important here. Brian mentioned that 75% of the traffic nowadays plus, sometimes I talk to the customers and they say it's about 90% plus of data center traffic flows east-west. But your firewalls are sitting on the perimeter and you do not necessarily have the visibility into your east-west traffic flows. So obviously you cannot protect what you cannot see. So visibility is all about inspecting those packets which are really important and every single packet flow uh, that you need to inspect. You can gain the visibility in multiple ways. You can use our panorama logs, you can use Cortex app, be it by third party or the partner, or you can build your own Cortex app to get, gain that visibility. We had a customer um, called Arizona Federal Credit Union. Arizona is one of the states in the United States. Um, they came on stage and uh, the customer mentioned that Hey, I, I didn't have to use any expensive application dependency mapping tools. He could leverage panorama logs to simply identify how the traffic flows are happening and then export it into, into Excel and Visio to just visualize how the flows are working and then implemented the entire micro segmentation using VMware NSX and Palo Alto Networks VM series firewalls. It was as simple as that. So you can use as cheap as panorama logs, but if you have a lot of money, then you can definitely buy the expensive application dependency mapping tools out there. So once you map the transaction flows, it's time for you to consider implementing zero trust architecture. Now, there are a couple of terms that I'm throwing out here, which is really important for you to understand. It is the difference between the attack surface and the protect surface. Attack surface is massive, while the protect surface is orders of magnitude smaller. Attack surface is huge, like you, when you move from traditional data center to software defined data center to public cloud, that attack surface is just exploding. But protect surface is your crown jewel, the most important applications that you wanna protect. And that is your protect surface. In your whole massy data center, you may not know what that protect surface looks like today, but it is definitely knowable. And we'll talk to you about how, how you can know about this. So we identify the protect surface using this acronym called DAS, Data Applications, Assets, and Services. So you can define this protect surface as one or multiple uh, combination of these four elements. Let's take an example of healthcare industry. In that case, what is the data that is most important? patient health information, PHI. What is the most important application that is containing those sensitive information and the data points? It would be APIC or either all scripts or Cerner. What are the assets that are really sensitive to, to, to some of these threats? Let's say the assets are medical equipment such as, such as city scanner. The services that can be easily compromised and that are really vulnerable to the attacks. In, in this case, let's say 
It's single sign or or a DNS server or Active Directory server. So once you identify this DAS, that is called protect surface. Now the next step for you would be to prioritize. You can prioritize based on some of the value of this protect surface, compliance requirements, and the relationship to the application owner. Organizations typically have found this quite troubling when you have the perimeter-based firewalling approach and you do not have inspection at the east-west level. Because if you have just a perimeter firewall which is way far from your protect surface, protect surface is sitting quite inside the data center. So it's time for you to consider moving those controls from the edge of the perimeter, from the edge of your data center, to a little bit downstream, way closer to where your protect surface is. Right. Once you identify that protect surface, it's time for you to connect it to the segmentation gateways. Next-gen firewall is a classical example of segmentation gateways, so that the traffic going in and coming out can be inspected by that segmentation gateway. And you can connect that segmentation gateway or multiple such gateways to the policy manager. In our case, it's Panorama. So let's talk about workload tagging, the third most fundamental piece in the puzzle. Like I mentioned, you must have the process for workload tagging. How many of you have your all the workloads tagged today, other than IP address? <laughs> How many of you are tagging the workloads? Right, two people, so about 2% of it. So definitely have a strategy to tag your existing and the new workloads because it will make your life super easy. When we talk to the customers, they tag their workloads across these four or six categories. It is about role, application, location, environment, classification, and compliance at most. For any VM workload that your application team is spinning out, do not have more than four to six tags per VM but definitely mandate the tagging as part of your strategy. The role could be web app DB, and I have the example of it. Application could be your SCADA, APIC, HR sales, etc. Classification, it could be level one, level two classification, or if it's a secret. Compliance, if you are doing the segmentation because of some compliance reasons, then you can tag those workloads as PCI workload or HIPAA workload. You can also have the environment, such as my dev test production workloads, right? Those are the three environments that you can. You can have more. Location, which data center this is located, right? Previously, people used to tag those workloads using this data center, this aisle, <laughs> but because of the virtualization, those workloads can move anywhere. So there is no point in you uh, giving a very fine location. Just identify where that workload is located. So I have some demo for you. But before that, here is the topology. I have some user segments here, the web admin and database admin, trying to access web VM and database VM. The web VM and database VM are protected by VM series. And obviously, VM series has a connected to the internet, connection to the internet, and it is also connected to Panorama. Panorama has a plugin architecture now. Uh, you must know about this. Uh, if not, then uh, we can talk offline about it. I'm more than happy to, to tell you a little bit more about the plugin architecture that we have implemented. Panorama has multiple plugins. I'll be demoing the vCenter plugin primarily, but this Panorama plugin helps you build dynamic address group based policies based on the tags. Those tags could be native to vCenter environment if you are running VMware workloads. We have also implemented these plugins for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Cisco ACI, and even Nutanix, right? And we are now uh, in the middle of building some other container-based plugins. So let's start the demo, how we will do the workload tagging. So this is the v VMware vCenter environment. Here, you go to tags and customer uh, category attribute. So let's create those four or six categories. Role is, being, is one. Then let's create application category. Uh, then we will create those environmental and classification, compliance, and location-based categories. And this is all, this is everything that you can do from vCenter, right? You are not doing anything in Panorama. So your application teams who are very familiar 
uh, with vCenter can uh, create all these categories. Then it's time for you to create the tags. So for each category, you can define the tags. In this case, the role could be a web, app, or DB. Uh, that, and similarly, we, if we just create, there are a bunch of tags that you will be creating. Now it's time for you to apply those tags to a workload. So like I mentioned, every workload can have up to four to, from four to six tags. Here in this case, we'll apply web. This is my uh, Amsterdam location. It's level one, PCA compliance. And it is my production workload running on HRM application, right? So four to six tags, and you will be tagging your work, existing workloads. And once you mandate this, for any new application that is being rolled out, you also need to make sure that they are being tagged. Now, Panorama has the plugin, so you go to Panorama tab, and then under the plugins architecture, you will see VMware vCenter. So then you connect Panorama to vCenter by giving the credentials of vCenter. Just validate those credentials, and then once you do OK, uh, Panorama has now a connection to vCenter. You can manage up to 16 vCenters from a single Panorama, right? up to 16. Now it's time for you to create the monitoring definition, which is just a combination of vCenter and the notify group. Notify group is a set of device groups that, where you want to populate the tags. Then do a commit into Panorama. So here is when all the configuration is stored. Now you can go back and do a refresh. You will see the status as success. And now you can start creating the dynamic address groups. You go under objects, create the address groups, and then instead of static, just add dynamic. Here you no longer have to write IP address and subnet based policies, but you are just selecting a bunch of tags. Let's say you want to write a rule for web. So you're just selecting the tags that we just created in vCenter for web. It is role web and in whatever location you want to set. Similarly, you create a bunch of dynamic address groups here based on application and uh, role, right? And once you do a commit, you will see that Panorama reached out to vCenter, pulled vCenter with all the associated IP addresses of uh, each of those dynamic address groups. So now that IP address to tag mapping is all done behind the scene. You no longer have to write the policies on IP addresses. So tomorrow your application team rolls out any new workload and tags with the right tags and categories, that IP address is automatically populated in the dynamic address group and you no longer had to write or update the policies, right? So it is as powerful as this, okay? All right. Fourth block, comprehensive policy. I tell this to my customer that, uh, Networking industry in general, <laughs> this policy keyword is very much abused by them. <laughs> when I, I was working um, somewhere else, not here, the only definition I knew about the policy was A can or cannot talk to B. That was the definition of the policy. It is very simple. A can or cannot talk to B. So the whole, there's a whole industry out there where it says policy, policy, policy. But what it means is just A can or cannot talk to B. That's not the policy definition. When I came to Palo Alto Networks, I realized the true definition of policy. And this is what we'll talk about. So micro-segmentation, just understand, it is more than a distributed way of enforcing access control list. This allowed deny kind of policy is just an access control list. It is not true security. The other thing that most of the customers miss out is having a very strong security at the perimeter, but having very weak security policies and the, the approach when it comes to protecting the micro perimeter. So what is your micro perimeter? It is the same protect surface that we just defined using data applications, assets, and services. That is your micro perimeter. And you must have a very strong security to protect that microparameter. A well-defined segmentation policies will include all these five elements, right? It is not about A can or cannot talk to B. It is about who can talk to who, what can they talk, where can they talk, when and how. And that is the comprehensive policy that we are talking about. So your policy, when you define it, it must have these five elements. App ID, user ID, URL filtering, threat prevention policies, 
and the file-based restrictions. When you have all these five elements in your policy, your policy is really comprehensive. And maybe we should develop a feature to give you a score in Panorama when you write a policy out of 100% how strong that policy is. We have not implemented this, but maybe we can consider. <laughs> and just understand that you are our customer. So you have a Ferrari. You have bought a Ferrari. So don't drive at 20 miles per hour, right? Just utilize it fully. It doesn't, it doesn't take more time to write this comprehensive policy. And it's not just because we have a product we are talking about writing this comprehensive policy. It's because if you don't write it in your micro-segmentation project, these are the use cases that will not be solved. The first one is, if you don't write that policy, how will you prevent DNS tunneling for command and control operations? How will you segment your HTTP2 applications? which are riding on the same port, but there are different applications on the very same port. If you just keep on writing layer three, layer four based policies, HTTP2, it is the same port, but you have multiple applications riding on it. How will you inspect SSL encrypted traffic? For most of east-west, most of data center traffic is east-west, but it is also encrypted. And how will you prevent the credential theft? And many more use cases like this. So I have another demo for you, but here we'll talk about the user ID-based segmentation and tag-based segmentation. So the same topology, I have web admin and database admin, part of the Active Directory group called web admins, and the database admin is part of database admin group. And here all other users can access the internet only for web browsing and no social media. So here we will allow only web admin to access web VM because Database admin should not have any access. At the same time, web admin also should not have any access to database VM. Then we will also make sure that vice versa. And if you look at tag-based segmentation that we'll do, we will be tagging all those workloads. We have already tagged them. So only VMs with web server, called web server tag is assumed to be web server. So definitely need to make sure that your application teams are tagging the workloads in a very right way. If they mistag it, there will be screw up in the, in the security policies. And here we will make sure that web servers can initiate only MySQL sessions toward the database server. And database servers cannot initiate any other sessions. Right? And web VM will have the access uh, coming from coming outside, and all the users can access the web VM. So let's, let's look at the demo. So you go to under policy. We have already created the dynamic address groups. So now we will create a, a policy called user to web servers. Here this is, a, and we will just give a tag to give a tag to the panorama policy that we created. Here the users, because we are writing user-based policies, will say, oh, web, web servers should be accessed only by web admins. The destination in this case would be web dynamic address group. So here the zone is web, and the a, a dynamic address group we already created called role web if you remember based on the tags that we selected. And the applications, we want to, uh, to allow web admins to do web browsing, plus for troubleshooting reasons, they may have to access, um, do SSH into those web servers. So SSH is allowed, no more application. Web browsing, app ID is way more, uh, uh, is way more secure than just opening the port 80 and 443. So now let's have threat prevention policies. So here we are writing antivirus policies and then uh, vulnerability protection and other policies will just uh, uh, inherit. So threat prevention policies, there are three or four segments to it. Wildfire policy also comes under threat prevention. So when you write this antivirus policy, you are, you are writing, the, you are enhancing the same policy with threat prevention, app ID, and user ID both. Now, assume that we are just doing fast forward here. So now vulnerability protection is done. Anti-spyware policy is also done. And now, time for you to write the URL filtering policies. So say, oh, social networking is not allowed. We need to block it. And the fifth component in the must-have policy block was file-based restriction. So let's start writing file blocking policies. Here we'll create a custom policy for file blocking. So some, some high-risk file extensions that we want to prevent. Here, let's just specify all the file types that we want, we want to prevent. So P being one, then we'll write 7Z, and bunch of files that you want, don't want to allow. 
So we'll block all the other files being transported. If there is any data exfiltration that you want to prevent, you'll be able to achieve that here. And set some alert. And this is the policy that we talked about. But policy had the component called who can talk to who, what, where, and when. So here we'll also specify the schedule, that this policy should be effective only during that schedule. From start time to end of time, and that is it. So it is, as you can see, the policy is not just about A can or cannot talk to B. It's not a simple allow deny policy. It has all five fundamental blocks of a comprehensive policy. Right? Okay. Hope this helps. The last but not the least block is adaptive security. Those days are gone when you had to write those subnet based policies. So what we are doing with adaptive security is you'll be writing the policies based on dynamic address groups and you'll take some automated security actions. And you can take those automated security actions by looking at the logs. So threat prevention logs, malware and phishing logs, data filtering logs. Once you identify that this particular server is compromised, you will be tagging it. And that tagging can be done natively within Panorama. Okay. Here in this case, we have identified this IP address as compromised. Once it is compromised, you would have pre-populated a policy called all the co uh, dynamic address group called compromised. Any IP that belongs to that dynamic address group using compromised tag will now start enforcing multi-factor authentication. Right? And that's the policy that we can do natively within Panorama. You can do that even today. And that policy is now posted. We have done HTTPS post. We can do it in on ServiceNow. We can post it into NSX and any other REST API. So if this makes sense or it's too complex to digest, all right? If it is too complex to digest, let me try a different approach. Going back to Game of Thrones analogy. When we talk about complete visibility, it's not just about north-south security. It's all about having the visibility at east-west. So you don't want to just have night's watch, which is just a north-south security for those who have watched this. You want to be brand the broken a three-eyed raven who can literally see everything. So have east-west visibility. Who said breach of the perimeter was not possible? What is a north pole of your data center? It's typically a firewall. <laughs> this north wall was also broken, right? Comprehensive policy and planning. Again, must ensure you have all five fundamental blocks in your policy. Make sure it is comprehensive when you plan. Who will do what, where, when? So zero trust, don't forget. Zero trust or you'll be the cyber victim. <laughs> this is the saddest episode of the entire season. Uh, Ned Stark, right? Just like and the analogy here is King's Landing. If you have King's Landing or the Iron Thrones that you have to protect, it, that is your micro perimeter. You must have very strong security. We are not talking about more and more security. It's about a very strong security that you need to have around the micro perimeter. Adaptive security. This is... This is the episode where uh, the Night's King was, was lured into, to, to come to, to Bran and was sort of quarantined. So you can do quarantining actions by uh, some techniques such as DNS sinkholing. Everyone has, any, anyone has used DNS sinkhole? All right, many of you, right? So that is, that is the feature that, that is like adaptive security actions. All right, so if you, if, Whatever I talked about was too difficult to digest. You can just remember these five things in this analogy, right? So be three-eyed driven, have east-west visibility, zero trust architecture you must implement. If you have iron thrones, which are your most important applications and assets or data and services that you want to protect, just tag them. So have the strategy for workload tagging. It will make your life very easy when it comes to implementing micro-segmentation. Comprehensive po policy and planning. And like I said, you have our next-gen firewall as a product. That means you have a dragon glass. It has the power to prevent the threats from coming in. So use that dragon glass fully. You have that Ferrari, drive it at full speed. Some closing advice for success. One, you cannot protect what you cannot see. So always have that complete visibility uh, in mind. 
Segment in phases, don't boil the ocean. When you start this micro-segmentation journey, do not start with the, the idea where you will be micro-segmenting all applications at once. Pick the ones where you can have a quick win and that be more strategic in terms of what you, applications you pick. There is absolutely no reason for you to have segmentation policies managed differently from threat policies. You must write segmentation policies and threat prevention policies from a very same UI. You need to have that single pane of glass where you are doing not only micro-segmentation, but also threat prevention. If you start segmenting the policies where some teams are managing segmentation, some teams are managing security, you will have fragmented and inconsistent security in the end. Imagine you are not just doing micro-segmentation for one environment. If you want to do micro-segmentation across traditional data center, software-defined plus public cloud, keep always this goal in mind that you want to write both the policy, everything in one, one, one place. Again, never settle for layer three, layer four policies, like I mentioned, the Ferrari example. Use policy optimizer. Uh, many of you must, how many of you are familiar with our policy optimizer? All right, some of you. If not, then do take a look at it. It will help you move uh, automatically from layer three, layer four policies to layer seven, right? Just by looking at the app ID logs, it will help you move to, uh, uh, to a more secure state. And what our customers tell us is, Microsegmentation is the project where we could bring in all our teams, applications team, network team, and security team under one umbrella, right? It was the project that united this team. So take this project, when you are embarking on this project, take that as an opportunity to unite the teams, right? Next steps, these are some of the resources available. So the slides are going to be posted. So do take advantage of the slides and uh, some of the resources, so check them out. Uh, I just have this uh, last quote for you guys. Don't have this micro-segmentation as your end goal. Once you start viewing it as a necessary approach to preventing successful cyber attacks, you will achieve much greater security in the end. So just see micro-segmentation as one of the ways to get there one of the ways to just achieve a bigger security, but keep that bigger security goal in the mind. Micro-segmentation alone is not a full-fledged security, right? With that, uh, your feedback really matters. Uh, both Brian and I value your feedback. Uh, this is how we grow both personally and professionally, so do take some minutes to, to give us the feedback so that next Ignite we can improve on our presentation, demos, what you like, what you did not like. But with that, thank you so much. And we are open for q and I don't know how much time. I think we are almost out of time, but we'll make ourselves available uh, right after the session here. Okay, so thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.